In the wilderness about 200 miles south of Tehran is a place called Half of the World. Isfahan, twice the capital of Persia, was the highlight of my journey to Iran in 2017. But to get there, it is necessary to negotiate the Zagros Mountains, a range of rocky cathedrals of stones and rocks spanning about 990 miles from the eastern edge of the Fertile Crescent and ending at the Strait of Hormuz on the Persian Gulf. Although overgrazed and deforested, scattered valleys do nurture grains like wheat and barley, lentils, nuts like almond and pistachio, and fruit trees bearing apricot, plum, and pomegranate, plus grapevines. The last Asiatic lions known to roam the foothills were photographed in the mid-19th century. The city of Isfahan seems about a century away from the villages in the foothills. In a dry basin, still at over 5,000 feet above sea level, lies what I believe is Iran's premier center of art, music, and culture. A Persian proverb said, Isfahan neste jahan ast, or Isfahan is half of the world. Isfahan is a north-south and east-west hub crossing Iran and was once one of the largest cities in the world. In the 16th and 17th centuries, under the Safavid dynasty, it became the capital of Persia for a second time. The Nakhche Shahan Square, translated image of the world, in Isfahan is one of the largest city squares in the world. It has been rightfully designated by UNESCO as a World Heritage Site. All of a person's needs, spiritual and secular, are fulfilled in or near this accumulation of communal structures and gardens. Among the masterpieces of architecture are the Mosque of Sheikh Lotfullah, the Royal Mosque, and the Ali Kapu Palace. At the north corner, the Grand Bazaar swallows up masses of shoppers. The 10th century Persian historian, Im al faqih wrote, when the Jews emigrated from Jerusalem, fleeing from Nebuchadnezzar, they carried with them a sample of water and soil of Jerusalem. They did not settle down anywhere or in any city without examining the water and the soil of each place. They did all along until they reached the city of Isfahan. There they rested, examined the water and soil, and found that both resembled Jerusalem. Upon they settled there, cultivated the soil, raised children and grandchildren, and today the name of this settlement is Yahudia. Isfahan is a haven for several religions to this day. Isfahan's main square truly is a metaphor the place called the image of the world. Reserves of petroleum are located in or near the southwestern foothills. Mining resources here have relatively direct access to the world transportation hubs through Hormuz. On the eastern side of the square, the Sheikh Lutfala Mosque, completed in 1619, was built by the chief architect Sheikh Baha'i during the reign of Shah Abbas I. The mosque was rebuilt and repaired in the 1920s under the tutelage of Reza Shah Pahlavi. Unlike the public Shah Mosque, or the Royal Mosque, standing on the south side of the square, Lutfala was intended as a private royal palace of worship. It has been open to the public, however. The inscriptions on the dome is written by the famous calligrapher Ali Reza Abbasi, in Toulouse and Nastalik styles. It's early morning, late September, as I stride across Medan-e-Shah Square, 
the Massif's Royal Square in Old Town Espahan. I am struck by the soft light of the morning sun ricocheting off the palace, mosques, madrasa, caravanserai. All treasures created by architectural and artistic activities carried out from the 8th through the 20th centuries. A few tourists and clerics stroll alongside the sprouting fountains at this time of day. The horse carriages that normally give wheels to visitors who want them are being washed and the horses are being fed. There definitely is something profoundly sacred and profane also about this place, suggesting to me that Esfahan is among a few locations on this earth that is a kind of beacon of creativity and sensibility that is broadcasting outward to a larger purpose. In September, as the holy Shia festivals of Muharram kick in, mullahs with religious enthusiasm for Islamic fundamentalism erect modest tents and benches in a quest to entice or ensnare the infidel. In extraordinarily friendly encounters, mind you, this is not the Islam of the battlefield by any stretch. Yet on the same field are reminders of the political demands that instruct modern Islam in the mid-world. Not so modest are the mosques that anchor the Grand Square. Besides the Lutfala Mosque, which we already visited, is the even more extravagantly decorated Royal Mosque, its courtyard, the Winter Mosque, which is the east wing of that mosque, and the school or madrasa. Not surprisingly, given its long history of restoration, this large domed building, its halls and courtyard, tucked behind the main minarets and entrance mirab, are currently under renovation and parts are off limits to the public. The mosque core structure dates primarily from the 11th century when the Seljuk Turks established Isfahan as their first capital. Additions and alterations were made many times since then. A simplicity of the earth-colored exterior almost doesn't prepare the visitor for the complexity of the interior decor. Cupola or dome soffits, the undersides, are a blast of very geometric designs and often include an oculus which is a circular opening to the sky. Ribbed vaults funnel the streams of lighting from the ever-moving march of the sun across the sky, creating a mesmerizing, very hypnotic introduction to the tunnel of heaven. Creative arrangement of bricks, mysterious motifs in stucco and tile work, and a perfectly constructed echo chamber in the center of the dome defy easy description as the timeless project entails an entanglement of refined artistry and application of geometry and physics. The courtyard and mosque are also a metaphor of the celestial paradise promised after death in the Quran. Tiles glazed in branch and foliage patterns cover the surface of the surrounding brick buildings and symbolize the fountainhead and plants in paradise. The domical ceiling, like others we have seen, shines like a kaleidoscope. In effect, earthy clay bricks were glazed, and colored ceramic tiles later were cut into small pieces and put together in intended mosaic patterns. It would have taken too much labor and time to cover the whole surface of the enormous royal mosque by this method. So, apparently, crafters invented a new method of depicting beforehand an arabesque pattern or figurative scene with polychrome glazes on each large sized tile panel of 20 to 30 centimeters and set them in place. This is known as the seven colors method that makes traditional Persian architecture unusually resplendent. The Royal Mosque is said to have required more than one and a half million ceramic tile panels.
On the western side of Isfahan's Grand Square looms the Ali Kepu, a towering pavilion topped by pillars under reconstruction and behind which was the Shah's palatial residence and royal gardens. To me, the structure at first appeared to be an extravagant warehouse. I was disabused of the false impression, however, shortly after entering the narrow halls, navigating past some of the crumbling plaster and fading tile works, and entering into the more palatially refurbished grand galleries that once entertained ambassadors of the Near East. The ceilings are particularly captivating. Rustic arched mirrors with nesting iron-like tarnished patterns, faintly colored, force me again to revisit my understanding and experience of color and design. Varying size stars, for instance, are scattered in the lacework and perched amongst the orbs of color rotating around a central point. I ponder their meaning, if there is any, and wonder about the craftsmen and women who conceive these combinations. My bafflement and wonder was only about to be shaken anew. My next encounter with royal extravagance at another royal destination, located in Isfahan's Nightingale Garden, presented a more objective view of the world. The Savafid's Hesh Bahest Palace features art that drifts away from the pure abstractions and religious sensibilities that overlap with the offices of the state on the Grand Square. In these back gardens, the human face and events of historical significance are given a larger-than-life treatment that is almost epic in scale. This two-story palace has about 20 rooms, built symmetrically on both sides. Among its highlights are the central hall, which consists of a skylight with decorative mirror artwork, porches on all four sides with wall paintings and knotted ceilings, and tall thin pillars that to me appeared to be a tad too oppressed by the weight of the ceiling they are holding aloft. Parts of this grand presentation, like so many world-class sites in Iran, are in disrepair, but very little imagination is required to be in awe of the luxury that the rooms of this mansion once conferred on its owners. With time, maybe days, maybe weeks, maybe years, it might be possible for an historian to assemble a dossier of the remarkable events portrayed on many of the walls, perhaps also identifying the key players and persons sacrificed there. All the battles, conferences, and celebrations offer clues of a culture in retreat, but the details, persons with and without heads, heads with or without persons, beards, mustaches, weapons, fashions of men and women are treasures beyond words for the modern citizen to protect and cherish. The past is also a plot for the present and scheme that is an inspiration of what we call modern.
Back at my hotel in Isfahan, the Abbasi, lucky tourists who secure a room there are introduced to hospitality that official Iran hopes will be appreciated by its guests. Its decor, courtyard, and ambiance are all packaged as palatial, and that is not accidental. The bedroom suite is spare and basic, but royal. The morning buffet breakfast was another familiar treat as my journey was coming to a close. I noted a wall mural depicting all women and a single man singing, dancing, and making merry in the glow of gold and turquoise. A memorial to an Armenian catastrophe, known as the Ottoman Massacre of 1915, has been established in Isfahan, where Orthodox Armenian Christians still number more than 10,000. The memorabilia of the catastrophic event is housed on the grounds of the famous Bank Cathedral in the new Jolfa quarter of the city, and are a somber tribute to an event that devastated a non-Muslim population in this region under the Ottoman not Persian rule. The Holy Savior Cathedral, or Vank, is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and undoubtedly one of the most beautiful churches in Iran. The Orthodox Christian structure displays a striking blend of Armenian and Safavid architecture. Built in 1606 and expanded in 1655, the church accommodated the needs of Armenian refugees from Ottoman lands. Adjacent vaults essentially draw from both the Christian and Islamic sensibilities. One literally drowns in the scenes from the Bible. other blast ornate colors with Islamic patterns all the way to the floor. A blue and gold painted central dome depicts the biblical story of the creation of the world and man's expulsion from the Garden of Eden. A cherub's head surrounded by folded wings is a distinctly Armenian motif. The ceiling above the entrance is painted with delicate floral motifs in the style of Persian miniature, which is an artistic technique that normally is applied to illustrate sacred texts like the Bible and Koran. The cathedral library contains more than 700 manuscripts and rare sources on Armenian and medieval European languages and arts. Two bands of paintings and murals cover the interior walls. The top section depicts events from the life of Jesus, while the bottom section depicts tortures inflicted upon Armenian martyrs by the Ottomans. Walking around this church, 
one gets an ever-changing charge of color and history. I only wish I knew more of the myths in history, as the hundreds and maybe thousands of characters depicted are overwhelming. After gazing on the Battle of Christianity, detailed and depicted on cathedral walls as a dual track adventure of biblical faith and cultural warfare, I leave the building and return to the Grand Square, where the tension of the book, that is, Islam's Koran, and of the streets and bazaar persist to this day. As everywhere, people here drift between the relics and edifices designed to inspire return to the stalls and shops to perspire, and eventually are compelled by age to simply retire and await the fate shared by us all. Whether Christian, Muslim, Jew, Buddhist, Hindu, atheist, or just a pilgrim. Entering the Grand Bazaar for the last time, one of the many similar still beating hearts of trade in Iran, I am immersed again in a swirl of buyers and sellers of families shopping or just relaxing, of tourists like me, gawking and feeling leg weary. It is only fitting in a way that before leaving Iran, we step back from the beauty and progressive qualities on display in the country to reflect on the reality that all is not gold and turquoise. The Near East, not unlike any other geographical regions of our world, has been cauldron of war, atrocity, greed and incompetence from time to time. Iran's governors and citizens are not blind to this fact. While some countries like the U.S. tend to perceive the nation of Iran with suspicion of all of its motives, it is important to know that many minority religions, even Christianity and Judaism, thrived in this Muslim land for centuries. The sun has set. A sickle moon is beginning to drift across the Grand Square. Children frolic beside the massive fountains, and electric lights come on to illuminate halls and walls that have stood for centuries, even millennia. Weapons of war backed into the shadows are silent and ignored. And since it is Muharram, men under a mobile tent dispense drinks to men and women gathered in clumps beneath a sign declaring, down with America. And then a stranger approached me, a hawker of Persian carpets, and asked whether I would like a free cup of tea. Mm -hmm. 